Today I am here with singer-songwriter Mutlu from Philadelphia, and we're going to talk about his new CD, Good Trouble, and hopefully get some inside scoop on the Philly sound, how it sounds today, a little bit of the history back there, and maybe even some inside scoop about Daryl Hall and John Oates. So welcome to the show, Mutlu. Uh, Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. Hey, I've been listening to your music online and very impressed, especially with a lot of your YouTube videos, a lot of your covers. But what I really want to start out with is uh, your new CD, Good Trouble. Um, Can you just get us up to speed with how that's doing and when you release that? Yeah, just released it, um, I guess, about a week and a half ago on uh, August 9th. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, it's been really exciting to get good good feedback on it. even just touring and starting to play the songs live and, um, and, and even just sort of in the first week or so people would listen to it, came out to some of the shows, um, to see them in like, you know, Nashville and Knoxville, Atlanta is kind of where the first few dates I played, uh, just to get the feedback, you know, it was like a year in the making to pull these songs together and then, um, and then to make the record and, you know, it's, it's kind of in an incubation stage. You don't really get a lot of feedback for a long time. So, so now to start getting that, that feedback and, uh, and see how people are connecting to it has been has been really great. Well, you know, in listening to your music, I try to listen with an open mind before I hear other people. But what's so funny is when I heard you and heard other comments about you, I kind of had the, the same impression, it, which is they say your voice is like silk. <laughs> you know, I bet you I bet you've heard <laughs> that a lot, and you know, you you hear that a lot about a lot of singers, but you're one of the few ones where it's true. You have this silky oh, <laughs> sound, and I think coming from Philadelphia, you also have that whole I think Philly sound thing going on. So I want to talk a little bit about you know who inspired you, who are your favorite singers, and you know who are the vocalists that you've really taken inspiration from. Well, um, you know, I would start, uh, if I had to really go to the cornerstone, I'd say, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, Marvin Gaye, um, Bill Withers, uh, Prince, Al Green. But then, like you mentioned, the Philly thing, that's a, that's a huge part of uh, my influence. You know, uh, thinking about groups like the Spinners, the Stylistics, uh, even though he has a, more, a much more gritty voice, Teddy Pendergrass, just the emotion he put into it. Um, the three degrees, you know, so, uh, Harold, um, Melvin and the blue notes, um, the list goes on and on and on major Harris, but just that Philly, um, sound that is really at its core. It's a hybrid of the sweet and the, and the grit, you know, you, you had the grittiness in it, but you had the lush strings, um, you had the beautiful harmony. So I think that I try to find that equilibrium within my own music too. Well, I definitely hear that, and I think what's really cool is that, you know, you're mentioning people like Teddy Pendergrass and, you know, the classics. I I think the R&B, you know, old school sound, you know, that never goes out of style. And I think there's a lot of people out there who, who hunger for that, not to say there aren't, you know, contemporary people, but... Not as much as in the 70s, it seems. Do you feel like, you know, you're carrying that torch and kind of reminding people of that great, you know, kind of R&B sound? Absolutely. I think uh, I think you're right on point with that. It's um, I feel most connected to a music in a time that was, you know, before I was born. And there is just some magic in, in especially those early, mid-70s R&B and soul records. Uh, it's something about, just you know, is that moment, is that time in the culture, uh, the way those records were made, the way they were recorded. I think it was more performance-oriented because you didn't have as much of the uh, digital gadgetry that we have now. And uh, I really feel most connected to that music. That's always kind of the deepest well for me as far as, uh, as, far as inspiration. So absolutely, I try to, I feel like I'm, uh, you know, connected to that era and try to just find my own way to, put my own personality, my own story, and modernize it in my own way. Well, when I first heard your voice, uh, one of the uh, first things that came to mind was Simply Red, who Ah, I think in the 80s, (laughs) Simply Red, because back in the 80s, you know, uh, Simply Red kind of was the one saying, hey, let's listen to the classics of the 70s, the old school. But even Simply Red's almost retro now. So it's kind of like you're right. even a generation later, 
you know, is there anyone else besides you out there right now that you think is still carrying that torch? Well, I would have to say um, my good friend Amos Lee, who I've toured with for years and collaborated with, he's definitely um, has that huge R&B soul influence, has an incredible voice. Um, as far as contemporary artists, I think, uh, you know, Mayor Hawthorne, uh, Alan Stone, Jamie Lydell, uh, there, there's still a lot of great singers that are kind of channeling that uh, in their own way. Of course, the late great Amy Winehouse, uh, she had it. She was sort of taking that girl group uh, and Motown kind of sound almost, and but but just totally making it her own. Uh, so I think it's still there. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's different sort of permutations of it, different variations of it. But you know right away, you hear it in the spirit of the music. You know within a minute or two of listening to somebody if they're channeling that. Well, you do a good job of using YouTube to connect to people. And I know that when you put out an album, yeah, yeah, and I know you want to, like, you know, promote Good Trouble, you want to promote your original music, but at the same time, it seems like you really want to pay tribute to your favorites. Like I was listening to this morning, uh, your cover of Michael Jackson. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you know the one I'm, I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, Rock With You. I think, yeah, the acoustic version of Rock With You. Yeah, that was... Uh, Acoust- that was one <laughs> acoustic. <laughs> yeah, I was really that impressed was because... Because, you know, you think that would be covered more because I see a lot of people on YouTube covering their favorites, but I hadn't quite mm-hmm. seen, you know, Rock With You acoustic quite like that. So I thought your choice was really interesting and I'm just curious, you know, what kind of reaction do you get from people? Do people say, oh, my goodness, you know, I love that song, too. I'm so glad you covered that. Yeah, that's um, that's that's a great one to hone in on because I, that's one of my favorite songs. And I think part of the uh, hook of doing that acoustically was you wouldn't necessarily think to do that acoustically. It's like because it's such a incredible track, and his vocal in the original just really sits over this amazing track, you know. And uh, – but in some ways, a testament to the song, uh, which is really about, you know, you can always take a great song and, and break it down. I should say Rod Temperton of Heat Wave was actually the one who wrote that song. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really right. a testament to the song. And I thought we, I, we just caught a good vibe and a good lighting uh, on that one, I guess. You know, we got the magic take. And uh, that's definitely one I've had a lot of feedback for. But sometimes it's, uh, it's taking something that has a really lush production and almost deconstructing it to just the vocal and just the song. And, you know, all the best songs usually tend to hold up that way. Well, when you do a little detective work on you on YouTube, besides these great (laughs) acoustic videos, you had some pretty cool stuff there. You had, uh, you're on stage with John Oates, singing Sarah's Mm -hmm. Smile with him. We got a little action in Daryl's house. You're with Daryl Hall. Uh, You did a song called Live In It. And mm-hmm. I, I think you're you're kind of modest. I, I think you got some bragging rights here. You hold your <laughs> own with Hall and Oates. That's pretty amazing. Well, thank you. Ben. <laughs> well, that's been like uh, you know, that's been like a dream come true because you know Daryl Hall and John Oates they're they're right up there among my musical heroes and uh, getting to just work with them. You know, I've toured a lot with them, opened for them in countless different cities, and getting to be on Daryl's house. Uh, Daryl sang on my first record. Uh, live in it. Um, John is featured on the new record. Uh, so I've had this just incredible opportunity to work with them. And, uh, you know, that's, it's been a huge honor because uh, what what they really connected to me to is that no matter where you're at in your career, uh, no matter if you're the most successful duo of all time, or just the indie DIY singer like me, you know, you musicians connect to musicians and singers connect to singers. And I, as soon as I met Daryl and John, we just had that that Philly soul, that, that musical kinship, you know, and uh, that's been just an incredible thing. Now, how did you first meet them? Uh, T-Bone Walk, the late, great T-Bone Walk, who sadly passed away, uh, about, I guess, uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, but he produced my debut album, uh, Live In It, and, um, you know, he was a longtime uh, band member and collaborator with Daryl and John. He, uh, for 30 years or so, you know, playing guitar, playing bass, being the band leader, co-producing records. And he worked with a lot of other great artists as well. Uh, but he uh, he produced my, my debut album. And um, pretty much like early on in the in the process, we were actually recording 
uh, some of the record at Daryl's uh, studio in upstate New York, and I met Daryl there. Um, I met him once or twice before he sang on the album, and he kind of heard what we were doing and really dug it. And then he sang on the record, and then a short time later I met John at an event they did in Philly. And um, it was kind of a cool bit of timing because it was right when Daryl was starting uh, live from Daryl's house. As a matter of fact, he hadn't launched the show yet. He had the idea for it. And I remember when he sang on my record, he was kind of telling he, – you know, I saw his vision for it. He sort of broke it down. And it's been incredible over the last decade to see – what a phenomenon that show became. But, um, but uh, yeah, it was an interesting bit of timing, uh, but it was really through T-Bone, and, uh, who was just a brilliant musician and, and producer, and I really think brought the best of me in that record. So that album is really connected to T-Bone and, and Daryl, um, and that's what led to it. Well, you seem to fit in really well on the at Daryl's house show, but uh, how many times have you been on it? Because haven't you been on it? probably more than anyone else at this point? Yeah, well, I'm maybe tied with uh, John and Todd Rungler. I've actually been on it three times, two that were on the sh- proper show. What happened was when he first launched it, uh, we did a thing in Texas at South by Southwest in Austin that was actually uh, at the time was like a live performance, it was like a live audience. They maybe had done the first few episodes, but we did this live performance. So I was on there at that time. Then there was the um, episode that was kind of my own episode. Well, it was actually a split episode with Chuck Prophet, but it was one of the first um, early, I think, episodes, maybe episode seven. So that was where we did Live In It. We did, um, you know, Man Eater and, and some of that. And then I was on there. I made a guest appearance when, when my friend Amos was on there, and uh, we did Caramel. So, uh, you know, I've, kind of, I've seen the progression. I've been on it at different points um, throughout, throughout the show's run, and uh, – that's you know that it just gives me a sense of pride to have kind of been so connected to that show from the beginning. Well, that's been an important show because I think it's really brought music back from, you know, the strictly commercial, hey, let's have a glossy album and just sell lots of copies to, hey, let's show how real musicians perform with each other, you know. Right, right, exactly, and I think that was Daryl's uh, instinct on it, and that's what. I've gotten from years of working with them. They, they care about performing and they care about songwriting. They care about musicianship. That's, that's what matters to them more than anything else, more than the accolades or the fame or that they're just true artists. And I think, uh, I think, you know, that's what comes through in that show. And he's, you know, he's, he, he's bringing in veteran artists. He's bringing newer, lesser known artists like me. And, um, you know, and John's the same way. I, I, John, you know, he loves the songwriting process. He loves collaborating with people. Um, it's always been great to get to do solo shows with him. I always go up and sing with him. And, uh, you know, they're just they're true musicians, and that's inspiring to me to see, okay, these guys are at the top of the mountain, but at the end of the day they're always connected to what matters most, which is that's what will keep you in the game through all the ups and downs is your love of the music and that connection to it, you know. Well, that that definitely shows, and um, it, it seems like they're very loyal, you know, it's one thing to, yeah. you know, jam with someone once, but to actually, you know, over the years to stay, you know, in their circle, it sounds like they're very mm-hmm. loyal to the people around them. Absolutely, absolutely. And, if you know, for me, they've just sort of taken me under their wing over the years. And uh, and, and that that was sort of, that connects even to the new record with, uh, um, with John and I. Like we, you know, over the years of playing shows with them, I'd always we'd always talked about writing a song together, so that came to pass a few years ago, and uh, that even brings us back to the Philly thing. Because when we sat down to write that song, nothing in this whole wide world, we wanted to channel that, like just a vintage mm-hmm. Philly thing, like you know, just that that type of song that had that kind of vocal vocal interplay, um, that had just a really great melody, and um, and uh, I think like we captured that um, Philly essence on nothing in this whole wide world. Very much so. Well, to give you a little plug, because you tour a lot, you know, you, you're very much into live performing. So Daryl Hall, besides his show, actually has a real restaurant and nightclub. And doesn't he mm-hmm. um, right. tape, tape his show there now, too? Yeah, he tapes the show there now. Originally, he taped it at his old place, and then they sort of uh, took over this venue and kind of recreated the atmosphere of, of the original barn. And uh, now it's a venue. So he does take the show there, but five nights a week it's a restaurant venue. And I, I've been playing there uh, pretty much from basically from the beginning. 
Um, actually, mm-hmm. I'll give you a little more. I, I'm actually the first one who performed on the stage because I played uh, two acoustic sets. Um, two night, you know, Hall and Oates played the grand opening, which was on Halloween, I believe. That was 2014, I think. Um, and but okay. two nights okay. before, just to give the restaurant a test run, they wanted someone to go play just so they could be prepared for the grand opening when Hall and Oates played there. So I actually played, and I've been a regular there since. I'm playing there in September. Um, so September 8th, actually. So that's a great room, and it's just kind of cool, I think, for the fans because you, they, you know, the show is taped there. There's just a lot of cool memorabilia from throughout Hall and Oates' career, and um, it's just it's a music place. I mean, the sound, the audio is incredible. Um, they kind of do a live video feed. They do live video feeds from there of some of the shows. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of a really cool component to the whole uh, live from Barrel's House uh, platform. Well, it sounds like that'd be a great place for people to hear you because, you know, everyone wants to play a big arena, but those the smaller intimate venues sounds like where you really connect with your audience. Yeah, yeah, no, and I've had an interesting experience of just all the years of touring with Hall Notes, of uh, touring with Amos Lee. I did a, a U.S. tour with, uh, with Joe Jackson a number of years back. I've, I've had a lot of experience as an opening act um, playing, you know, uh, theaters, performing arts centers, amphitheaters, even some arenas. Uh, but on my own, I play small, intimate clubs and listening rooms. And, yeah, you know, I mean, it's an amazing experience to, I don't know, play like the Greek Theater or Chastain Park in, in Atlanta, places like that. But uh, there's also just a magic that can only happen in an intimate uh, place, you know, that, that you just can't recreate anywhere. You can't recreate it in a big place. And uh, and I think um, that that's kind of where music is at its purest, I guess. That's where you find the purest connection to the audience, between the artist and the audience, so uh, and I think they have that going at Daryl's because it's a it's an intimate spot. No, definitely. And that uh, September, you're also going to be playing, I think, a little bigger venue. Now, is yeah. are you like opening or sharing the bill with Hall and Oates on the 26th? Uh, definitely opening. <laughs> but yeah, I'll be opening for them at the uh, Verizon <laughs> uh, big, big sports arena in in Little Rock, Arkansas. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, um, that's, that's, you know, that, those are the two extremes, you know, playing like 150, 200 seat club. And that's mostly what I'm playing on my own on my current tour and then going into like an 18,000 seat arena. So it's, it's fun. It's fun to be at the two extremes and, uh, you know, music is music is music at the end of the day, but you know, just vastly different experiences. Well, when they go on, you know, do they ever pull you up since you're there? Do they ever ha- have you jam with yeah. them or? More so, um, usually, I mean, I primarily tour with Hall & Oates as the duo in the bigger places. With those shows, I usually just open up. But I've also done a bunch of uh, solo shows with uh, Daryl and John. Um, some with Daryl, oh. some with John that are in more intimate places. And usually at those solo gigs, I'll almost always go up, Like especially with John. Um, I've done it with Daryl, too, because I remember we did a tour right around the time early on when he launched Daryl's House, and I would come up. Um, he kind of recreated the set, and he was playing like maybe 1,000 seat places, so I would sit in with him there. We kind of almost recreated the vibe of Live from Dallas House. And then anytime I play with John, he always brings me up for at least a song or two, sometimes even more. Um, and so, yeah, definitely it's been fun to sing with them live in these different uh, scenarios, you know, because there, there's, again, there's that magic that just happens with an audience. And, uh, you know, to be up there with your heroes, there's nothing better than that. Well, it seems like when you're building up your own audience, if you – you know, have a group like Hall and Oates that has such a similar audience that I, I think they would automatically appreciate, you know, your music right off the bat. It sounds like there's so much value in, you know, partnering with people that, you know, have a fan base that, that'll share. That's been huge for me. I mean, over the years, um, the, 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 the two acts that I've toured with most, that I've worked with the most are um, Daryl Hall and John Oates and, and Amos Lee. I mean, and that's, it's fitting in a way that those are Philly guys, you know, that's who I've put in years and years of work with my ability to even just go out and tour on my own now is thanks to the tours I've done with them and just getting to collaborate with them. And, and, and the Philly thing is with all three of those guys, Daryl, John Amos, that's a deep connection. Um, just, uh, you know, it's something in the water in Philly. I guess it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful, it's a powerful uh, thing, you know? Now, on your bio, it says you're a first-generation American of Turkish descent. Does that mean your parents are from Turkey? 
Yeah, my parents are Turkish. They moved here, uh, I guess, well, about 45 years ago when they were uh, when they were young, when they were in their 20s. Uh, and, um, you know, I was born and raised here, although I used to go to Turkey every summer for a year. I even lived there for a year when I was a kid because, you know, my folks wanted me to learn how to read and write and speak in Turkish. And that was uh, – that's, in a way, that I think sparked my love of traveling, why I love touring mm-hmm. so much because from a young age I got to see two different cultures. You know, I'd spend most of the year in the States, and then every summer I'd go visit Turkey and uh, and go visit my family there. And um, that's mm-hmm. I feel really lucky that I had that perspective, kind of to see two co- different cultures growing up. Mm-hmm. Sure. Does Philadelphia have a big uh, Turkish community? Um, there's a decent, decent, well, not a huge community per se, but there's a decent amount of Turkish folks, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I think um, you, I think you find a lot of university students who come, you know, from Istanbul in particular and study, and some stay, some go back. But, um, yeah, it's, there's, you can definitely find it. There's definitely a cool uh, cool kind of contingent of Turkish folks in Philly. But it, I wouldn't say it's a huge community, but it's definitely there. Well, nice, because it's always nice to discover, you know, different communities and pockets, you know, around the country. So that Absolutely. sounds really interesting. Yeah, well, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, not right away, but I want to make sure before we do that, people looking for you now that they've heard about all your cool YouTube videos and stuff, where is the best place for them to find you, uh, find your music, and to buy your music? So I'll start with the site. So first, I have a brand-new website. It's uh, mutlusounds.com, M-U-T-L-U-S-O-U-N-D-S, at mutlusounds.com. You can find me at Facebook slash Mutlu, and then Instagram um, and Twitter at Mutlu Sounds, uh, YouTube slash Mutlu Sounds. That's kind of become my branding thing, you know. So on all the big socials, and then uh, records on Spotify, Good Trouble, Apple Music, Amazon, Google Play, all the big uh, major streaming services. Um, and for show info, I'd say the best place to go is the, the show page of my website, mutlusounds.com slash shows. Um, that'll put you right to ticket links for everything. So kind of kind of a cool mix of shows coming up. Um, got uh, got New York City this Thursday, and then next week um, up to New England, Northampton, Boston, um, you know, and some more more cool stops along the way. Going to be playing a hometown show in Philly, um, but the uh, full the full schedule is uh, is there. So that's those are probably the best places I would say. Excellent. Yeah, I would encourage people if they go there to look at your tour schedule because you are very active in that. So it sounds like you got a lot of gigs coming up in the fall. Yeah, I definitely wanted it was important was releasing the record uh, to, you know, I kind of um, for August and September, I really wanted to be out on the road. And and uh, just as the music is getting out there to be able to play the tunes, I'm playing three or four songs from the record each night. Um, that's that's a magical thing to kind of live with these songs, but then to get to play them and see how people react. Um, uh, that's, that's sort of a, that's one, that's really in a lot of ways, the most important thing is playing live and just connecting to people. There's nothing like that really. So for all the millennials or even, I don't know what you call the younger than millennials, generation wide, (laughs) the new people who grew up just hearing contemporary music, if they're going to dive into the Philly sound, throw out a couple of artists or songs that would be a good crash course and like that Philly sound appreciation for the young generation to listen to. I would say if you're going to go right to the classic uh, vintage sort of Gamble and Huff era sound, really get that. As I would say uh, Love Train and Backstabbers by the OJs. I would go to, uh, now I'm a little biased on this song because I love singing this song. I've actually sung it with John Oates. But I love "Won't Let Me Wait" by Major Harris. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see, uh, uh, "Get Up Everybody," you know, Teddy P and Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. I mean, there's an endless list, but I say those tunes, those are some of the quintessential songs. Uh, I would say, um, you know, maybe "Rubber Band Man" by the Spinners. Um, but I would just say check those groups out because there's a deep catalog with all those bands: Spinners, Stylistics, the OJ's. Harold Melvin, the Blue Notes, and of course, Hall and Oates were part of that. They came up working with all those groups. Um, they kind of eventually went mm-hmm. off into more of a kind of hybrid with the singer-songwriter sound, the rock sound, but they're rooted in that as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's important for younger kids to hear some of that music. You know, I think maybe Motown is a bit more recognizable, uh, but really in the 70s, it was all about the Philly sound, you know, so uh, 
that's a deep well, and uh, you know, hopefully, younger kids continue to discover that music. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the OJs because I finally saw their appearance on Daryl's house, and I think that was oh, one of the yeah. best I've heard. That's great. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. That they, was, that's the kind of magic that happens on that show. I mean, to see the OJs with Daryl and that incredible band. Uh, that he has, um, yeah, that was that was one of the. I mean, they've, they're probably seventy five episodes in, but that that episode I would say is right up there among the best, no question. Mm-hmm. Well, now that you've had a chance to work with you know Paul and Oates and Todd Rundgren and all these cool people, for the person that you have not worked with, who would be that dream collaboration that you that you haven't done yet, but that you think you have a really good shot at? Well, I don't know if I have a good shot at it, but without a question, Stevie Wonder. I would I would love to connect with him, meet with him, collaborate, whatever. That's, that's the high up on the bucket list because uh, that run of records that Stevie had in the early, mid-'70s, talk like uh, where I'm coming from, music of my mind, talking book, inner visions, uh, fulfilling this first finale, songs of the key. Like those six albums are like it kind of really, to me, like the holy grail of, modern R&B music. So I, I would have to say Stevie. So maybe I'll put it in the universe. Somehow it'll happen at some point. <laughs> hey, the, the the first thing is putting it out there. And once you do that, your odds greatly yeah. improve. So I totally appreciate exactly. you taking the time out to talk today. Lou, love your music. And I just encourage people Thanks. to seek you out online and really get up to speed on you and your career. Right on, man. This was great. Thank you uh, so much for having me.